uh, say please wait. All right, in Jesus' name. And if you don't have it at hand, it's on the monitors there. The scripture reads, when Jesus heard it, he said unto them, they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And I'm going to talk to you briefly this evening from this subject, the waiting room. The waiting room. Pastor, if you would pray for us, please. Come on, let us pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise, oh God. We thank you, Lord God, for the reading of your word. Right now, as the word, oh God, goes forth, that which we have read, let it be applied to our lives, oh God. Father, you've given your son, Lord God, the word to teach us tonight. I pray, Lord God, let the anointing flow. And Father, let his lips, Lord God, and his tongue be a ready writer, O God, that he will speak according to the Holy Ghost of what you've given him. Father, I pray that we would all be able to say, it was good that we came back to the house of the Lord tonight. Father, I pray, touch hearts, O God. Let conviction fall in this place, O God. Let the anointing and the Holy Ghost move, O God. Awake us to receive it, O God, that we will believe your word as it is said and as it is read. In the name of Jesus Christ, O God, we thank you. We buy in every spirit of distraction and everything that is unlike you. That, Lord God, your will will be done. In Jesus' mighty name. Somebody say, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. You may be seated in Jesus' name. Amen. The waiting room. Now, when you go into a waiting room, oftentimes you have to wait, especially in the ER. And so growing up, as I was uh, growing up, I was very sick. Uh, I, I messed myself up quite a bit. I was into the sports. I was into the boxing, the wrestling, and all this other stuff there. And I was good at it. So I had bragging rights to do it. I mean... I had, uh, in the midst of all of that, I had asthma attacks. I was sick. I would cut myself. I would hurt myself. Not intentionally, but it was just something that was given up to me. And so as I got older, I began to get more involved into these sports. On the wrestling mat, I was 13 and 1. And I lost to a guy who was 270. And I was 220. So you can imagine the difference in the size. I also ran a 4, 8, and a 40. And that was incredible for someone weighing the weight that I weighed, 220, 225. I thought I was invincible. I had the strength, I had the dedication, and I had the size. But I was proud. I was proud. And I was being successful at becoming a God to myself and to the individuals who were looking into my life. And so it was always about my name, my image, and my ability. And as talented as I was, not many months later after coming out of high school, I eventually got to a place where I suffered two injuries. And so these two injuries cost me the chance to play ball. One was a knee injury. I tore my ACL and my meniscus. And I had to have surgery to get it repaired. The other one was just something that was inevitable. It was a heart condition. And with this heart condition, it kept me from doing much of any activity. I couldn't lift weights. I couldn't run. Uh, I couldn't do anything. I, I really couldn't do much at all. This heart condition that I had, whatever it was, it would not allow me to use my body to function the way that I would want to function. And so I went to the hospital and they told me that they didn't see nothing wrong. After sitting in that waiting room for hours, just for the physician to come and see me and say, ain't nothing wrong with you. Mind you, I didn't have insurance, and that's probably why they didn't check me out. You know, when you don't got insurance, they don't get paid. They don't want to see you anyway. But I was on faith insurance. I was like, God, I'm here. Somebody going to see me. Nobody came to see me. They kicked me right back on out. But I thank God anyhow. My wife was with me, so she had to experience that with me. Um, I was at the house that day, and um, when she got home, I was actually in the bathroom. And I had my head under the water as the water was coming down because I couldn't, I couldn't walk. I was always dizzy. Uh, my heart was racing for no reason. I thought maybe I had too much coffee or, or something. I don't know what the issue was. But finally, when we decided that we were going to go to the waiting room, just before we leave the house, my wife, you know, she's so small, she was trying to hold me up because I couldn't, I couldn't walk on my own. When we get outside and we get to the front patio, 
I fall to my knees strong up blood. It wasn't food, it wasn't a mixture of anything, it was blood. And the only thing I could do was grip my heart. I couldn't murmur any words. And after explaining that to the doctor, son, you all right? Go on home in Jesus' name. We'll give you some Tylenol. They prescribed me some over-the-counter medicine and sent me right on home. And so, not too long after, I know a minister at Victory back in Tampa. He preached a sermon on how God is a deliverer and a healer. And so I saw people running to the altar and I said, I'm not going to go. Because I was feeling irritable. I was sick. I didn't feel like getting bumped. You know how you have the altar, sometimes people slap you and they, they just worship and don't take offense at it. I didn't feel like dealing with that. So I said, no, I'm not going to go up there. I, I couldn't really move fast anyway. And I would get dizzy and nauseous. And these were just some of the excuses that I gave God as to why I didn't go and get my healing. That night at the altar, I looked down and I seen nothing but a, broke, a bunch of broken people. A bunch of broken people. And they were my brothers and my sisters. And even though the physician showed up, I, and I was right there in the waiting room, I missed it because of the excuses produced by reasoning. But I couldn't get the sermon out of my mind. I, I'm thinking that God, I went to the doctor, I've taken all these natural remedies, I drink in the tea, I'm trying to get my heart right, what's going on? And so God tells me, go to that man of God, the same man who preached the sermon. Now he's in his car, he's about to pull off. And I'm like, well God, he, he need it. <laughs> I don't want to bother him. He leaving. He just put the stroller up. He got the kids in the car. So I go to him anyway out of obedience. God said, go. He said, what's going on, bro? What is it that you need? He said, sir, uh, God told me to come to you because you preached that word. I need a healing in my, in my heart. There's something wrong and the doctors don't know what it is. He touched my chest to pray for me. And I felt the shock. You will not believe what happened after that. Nothing. Nothing happened right after that prayer. And God later on made me realize why nothing happened. He said, because you went in obedience, but you had no faith. You sat in that waiting room for so long, hoping that someone would see you, but you were expecting the worst. So how do you expect to get better when you're just expecting the worst? And so I realized later on, as you can see how I run on this altar here, as you see how I be having, I can hold my son. I couldn't do that. And had I had my son at that time, I couldn't do it. My body would not allow me to. This is why I'm excited to say I can run. This is why I can take joy and say I'm going to go lift weights. This is why I can say, God, I thank you because it was God that healed me. Nobody healed me. Every doctor I went to, every doctor I saw did not want to see me. Or they say, nothing wrong with you. After all the tests that were taken. The Revelation 12, 11 says that they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto death. So my question to you this evening, what is your testimony? What has God done for you? You may be facing an issue similar to the last one. But the same God that brought you out then is the same God that can bring you out now. If you don't got a testimony, let me just tell you some of mine. God delivered me from sickness. God delivered me from people who did witchcraft to me. God delivered me from people who wanted to harm me. God delivered me from fatal situations. There was a semi-truck that hit me. And I'm standing here to tell you today that God is able to keep you in all ways. In Jesus' name. No one can tell me that God is not a healer. No one can tell me God is not a deliverer. Because I've experienced for myself. I can see you just trying to explain it to me and I had no experience but it's too late to tell me he can't deliver. It's too late to tell me he can't heal because you're looking at a walking testimony. I couldn't walk like this before. I couldn't jump like this before. I couldn't run like this before. But I can do it now and I take joy in that. It is God that healed me. In Jesus name. So understanding that I have three very quick points for your consideration. Firstly, the house of God is a hospital for the broken. The house of God is a hospital for the broken. There's three types of people that you see that exist. And we're going to look at this in two senses. The Jews, the Samaritans, and the Gentiles. The Jews are God's chosen. The Samaritans are those that are part Jew or Gentile. And then you have the Gentile, which is us. On the other hand, you have three types of people that exist in a hospital. You have the desperate, you have the mediator, and you have the commoner. Now the commoner is somebody that comes into the hospital 
and they're looking for the first doctor that they can see. I'm sorry, rather, the uh, uh, the desperate one is the one that comes into the hospital. And what they do when they go in, they don't just come and stroll in. They come in and they're looking for a doctor to let the doctor know, Doc, I need you to come and see about me. Doc, I need a healing in my, something's not right, doctor. Come on, send somebody to come and see me, quick. These are the people who are desperate. They're not afraid to say, I don't care what you think. I don't care what you're looking at. I don't care how I sound, but I need help. Amen. These are the desperate. Then you have those that come in the condition where they can't cry out because they've been so wounded. To where they're supposed to be considered fatal or near death. But they have someone crying out for them. And it's called a mediator. If you ever been to the hospital, you see someone on their deathbed just lying there looking like they're dead, but someone was right next to them talking to them. And that person that's talking to them is the third party between them and the doctor, letting them know, I'm with you to the end. Doc, I need you to save this person. That's what you call the mediator. And then you have the commoner. The commoner. The commoner is someone who's been sick so long that they just accept this sickness as a way of life. I'm sick. I've been like this too long. I've been like this most of my life. No one can help me. We all got to die one day. These are the ones that sit there and feel sorry for themselves. And when you have that mindset to say that your sickness is just a way of life, you have no drive or desire for deliverance. Because you've already embraced the thing that's killing you. And you've settled for death. Therefore, when an altar call happens, and the fire is hot. God is here. But you miss the move of God because of your mindset. And here's the tragedy. Sometimes those commoners die in the waiting room. Because of their unbelief. Because of their doubt. Because they don't trust God enough. They die in the waiting room. And so these people are those that tie their identity to their sickness. And they say, this is who I am. Lung disease. So I am. Cancer. It's who I am. Sickle cell. It's who I am. Kidney failure. It's who I am. Asthma. It's who I am. Tumors. It's who I am. High blood pressure. That's who I am. And why do they claim these things? It's because they've lived with it for so long, they don't know anything else. They've attached their identity to their sickness, and as long as you call the name of their sickness, they can respond. But God is saying this ought not to be so. It's the same thing spiritually. We struggle with things for years. Dealing with secret sin. Dealing with the roots of the sin that no one else sees. Dealing with the thoughts that plague your mind with those wicked imaginations. And your motives that aren't always pure. And we become desensitized to it all. And even desensitized to the conviction. Because we've minimized the penalty of sin. But we've magnified the focus of pleasure on that sin. We minimize the penalty, but we maximize the pleasure. And so, this is what we say. Lust, it's who I am. Perversion, it's who I am. Pride, it's who I am. Anger, that's who I am. Adultery, that's who I am. Fornication, that's who I am. Rebellion, that's me. Slothfulness, right here. Insecurity, you're calling my name. Anxiety, yes sir. Addiction, that's me. Unforgiveness, that's who I am. And God was saying, stop saying that. Stop saying that. That's not who you are. Just because you've lived with it so long doesn't mean that that's who you are. You've just embraced the thing that's blinding you from your healing. And so you're sensitive, and I'm the great physician. This is what God was saying. You are sensitive. But I'm the great physician. Family, look around. Look around tonight. These are your brothers and your sisters. And we are here tonight in the hospital. We are here tonight in the waiting room. And some have needs that no one else knows about. Some have hidden needs. Some needs are blinded. Some needs are hidden. And some needs are open. But nevertheless, every single solitary soul in here has a need from God. And whether they told you or not, they have it. When I was sick, the minister prayed for me, and I went in obedience, but again, I had no faith when I went to that minister for prayer. Let's look at this scripture, James chapter 1, verse 6. James chapter 1, verse 6. It says, but let him ask in faith nothing wavering. 
For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and toss. Now, here James was talking about asking for wisdom. But there's a principle that I want to examine here. There's a principle that I want to examine. Let's look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 8. Because we see James is saying, ask. But let's see what Matthew is saying. Matthew is saying, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And to everyone that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, the door shall be opened unto you. Could it be that the acronyms of this word ask is the same thing that God is trying to push us to do in prayer? Ask, A, seek, S, knock, K. The whole principle of the scripture was God saying, whatever you ask of me, I'm willing to give it to you. But don't ask me in doubt. Ask me in faith. You're waiting and you're waiting for me to move. You're waiting and you're waiting for me to move on your behalf. But you keep asking me. I want to answer you, but you're not answering, asking me in faith. Your heart is not right when you ask me for what you want. And I can't give you it. I want to give it to you. I'm longing to give it to you. But I can't because your heart is not right. You don't believe me enough. You don't trust in me enough. You talk about me, but you don't talk to me. You know about me, but you don't know me. And God is saying, I want to give it to you. But come to me in faith. Stop coming to me in doubt. Stop coming to me in fear. Stop coming to me in anxiety. Even when you're praying, I don't know what, even when you're praying in your closet at home, the same principle applies. Ask me in faith. Ask me in faith. Amen. And so it's been said that this ETH is there for a reason, not only as an archaic language or the Shakespeare language, but it means to do continually. And so what he's really saying in verse 8, he's saying, for everyone that keeps asking will keep receiving. And if you keep seeking, you'll keep finding. And if you keep knocking, I'll keep opening these doors unto you. And this is where he's really talking about prayer. So the question is, how long are you willing to bang on that door? How long are you willing to seek for your healing? How long, people of God, are you willing to ask over and over and over and over and over again? The answer should be until I get it. The answer should be until it happens. You got to wear God out. The Bible talks about the lady, who, the unjust lady. Somebody just preached on it recently. He said this lady was wanted to be avenged, uh, uh, avenged. And the judge didn't fear God nor regarded man. But because of her constantly going to the individual and saying, I need you to do something. I need you to avenge me. I need you to stand on my behalf. I need you to answer me. I need you to move for me. I need you to touch me. I need you to help me. The, the, the unjust judge said, you know what? Not because I fear God. Not because I care for man. But because she's wearying me with her crime. She's wearying me with bothering me. They're always asking me. And so because of that, I'm going to give it to you. Amen. God is saying, approach me the same way. You go to your neighbor that way. Why don't you go to God that way? You go to your friends that way, mama and daddy. But why don't you go to God that way? And so Jacob wrestled with the angel in Genesis 32, 24 through 30. It says that Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him unto the breaking of day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against them, he touched the hollow of his eye. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, the angel talking, for the day breaketh. Look at Jacob's response. He said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. I will not let you go, Lord, except you bless me. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall no more be called Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince that hast thou power with God and with men and has prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, tell me, I pray thee, thy name. He said, wherefore is it that you need to know my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of that place Peniel. For I have seen God's face, the face. And I have been preserved. This mindset for Jacob to wrestle with the angel of God required a certain mindset. He didn't just go up there with the mindset of being timid. He didn't just go up there with the mindset of unbelief and doubt. He went up there saying, you know what? 
I'm going to show you what I'm about tonight. I'm not letting you go until you speak something to my life. His blessing was a change to his identity, and a change in his identity affected the generations after him. So that thing you're not willing to fight for can help the people that come after you. But you've got to come to God with faith. You're waiting, and you're waiting. But don't let your waiting be in vain. Don't let your waiting be in vain. You'll never appreciate freedom until you know what bondage feels like. The prison is always irrelevant until you're the one in it. You never regard the people that are locked up until you're the one in that position. Then you want somebody to care for you. But here's what happens when you don't regard the people that's already behind the bars. No one's going to regard you when you're there. Oh, they got to fit it for themselves. You'll have to do the same when your time comes. And so whether it's a spiritual bondage, whether it's a physical bondage or a mental bondage, some people are there for a reason. And God would allow some people to stay there because that's the only place they'll find God. Some, some people can be free from their bondage. But some people stay there because God is saying that's the only way you'll know me is through pain. You'll only know me through suffering. The, the moment I deliver you, you're going to go back out there and eat your vomit. So I'm going to leave you here for your soul's sake. I'm going to leave you here so you don't get your soul thrown into hell. And that's considered the mercy of God. That's considered the mercy of God. Sometimes that's the only thing holding them and keeping them humble. This here leads me to my second point. You won't be delivered if you don't know what's written. You will not be delivered if you do not know what's written. Matthew chapter 4 verses 1 through 11. It says, then, was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil? And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, I know you're hungry. Command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, what? It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh them up into a holy city and set up them on a pinnacle of the temple. And said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. Is the devil talking back to him? For it is written, Jesus, he shall give us angels, he shall give his angels charge concerning them. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil taking them up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And said unto him, all these things will I give thee. I'll give you everything that you're looking down upon right now if you would fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said unto him, get thee hence, Satan. So no longer was it, it is written. It is written. At this point, he had to say, get behind me. How dare you? I created all of this and you're going to offer it back to me? It is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Notice the devil never left until he started speaking the word. Had he decided to lean on logic? Had he decided to lean on reasoning? Had he decided to lean on anything else other than this word? He probably would have been towards these deals. Had it been one of us, we probably, I know you're the devil, but I don't even know what's written anyway, so I might as well. This is the dangers of not knowing your word. You quote the scripture, but do you know what the scripture means? You know, and I don't know where I'm going here, but I'm going to go here. We talk about the kingdom of God. We often talk about wanting to go into the kingdom of God, but how many of us are using the keys properly? These scriptures that we read are the keys. Who's using the keys properly? There's three keys to get into the kingdom of heaven. We talk about it every day. Repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. Which means there's three locks. There's three keys. There's three locks. You can't have two out of the three. You need all three. And so if you don't have all three, that means you have no access into this kingdom that you talk about all the time. You have no access into this kingdom that you boast about and witness about. Your witnessing would be in vain. Because you don't understand 
your scripture or your word. And so my question that I started to ask myself, how many battles have we lost because we didn't know what was written? How many fights and blows have we taken because we did not know what was written? How many years have we had to deal with sickness and disease because we didn't know what was written? How many people have died because they didn't know what was written? The Bible says his people perish not because of the devil, not because of famine, not because of disease, not because of pestilence, not because of earthquakes, not because of people killing people. These contribute to the death of mankind, yes. But the Bible clearly states why his people perish. And it's because they lack knowledge. They lack knowledge. If that be the case, knowledge ought to be the very thing that you need to pursue above all things. The knowledge of what? The knowledge of who he is. What he's commanding of you. How do I get there? You can't answer these questions unless you know these scriptures. It's not enough to just come and hear it, but you have to apply them. It's not enough to just come. The Bible talks about not only being a hearer of the word, but also being a doer of the word. And so we got to focus on who he is. What's his name? What does he want from mankind? Let's look at the book of Hosea. Chapter 4, verse 6. It says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. That thou shalt be no priest to me. In other words, don't pray to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Why do you think people will profess to know him in that great day? Turn to Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. It says, not everyone that said unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, yes, they believe because we know these signs shall follow them that believe. But even the devil believes and trembles. If you don't believe me, let's pull up the scripture. James chapter 2, verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God. We preach that, don't we? We preach that there's one God and no trinity, right? That means the devil believes the same thing you believe and he trembles. The Bible right there says the devil also believes and trembles. But he's not going back with God. So your belief alone will not get you into the kingdom. Your belief alone will not deliver you out of your circumstance. Here's the issue. Many are intimate with the work of God, but not with God himself. This is why he's going to say, I never knew you. We were never intimate. You didn't talk to me often. You talked about me. You were about my business. You did my work. But it's just like you go to these secular jobs. You work a job. The CEO, you never met him, but you've seen pictures of him. You read his biography, but you never met him. And so you still get paid. You still get your 401k. You still get your good benefits, health, dental, vision, and all that good stuff. But then you try coming across that CEO that you just saw the picture of outside of that job. And you say, hey, I, I work for your job. Oh, you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saved your car. I, I even patched up that window. You had a crack in your window, and I fixed that. I saved the company from a lot. I saved a lot of money on the company. Okay, thank you, but I don't know you. I've never met you. If you have no relationship with that CEO, your speech means nothing to him. It's the same thing with God on that day. If you have no relationship with God right now, your speech on that day will mean nothing. He's going to look at you just like that CEO looks at these individuals. I'm just, I'm just about my business. I don't know you. you. You took care of business. Thank you. But yeah, go get out of here now. It's time for you to go. God is going to look at the individuals that same way. And so without the knowledge of the word of God, which is God himself, we cannot, we will not, we shall not stand in these end days. We have a form of godliness, but we'll be religious. But we will lack relation. We'll know the scripture, we'll sing, we'll shout, we'll do all of this good stuff. But then there's no prayer life. Then there's no communion with God. But then you still got hate in your heart. But then you're comfortable in your sin. But then you're comfortable in your secret sin. 
then you're comfortable with those wicked thoughts. You're comfortable with the wicked imaginations. And it's almost as if, well, God, no one sees it. No one can read my mind, Lord. And that's the wrong person to talk to and say that. God, no one can read my mind. I can. You straighten up real quick. But people of God, this word tonight, God has given me to let us know you're in the waiting room. And this lack of knowledge can damage you and it can damage the people around you. Leads me to my third point. Obedience is key to your deliverance. Obedience is key to your deliverance. If you go to the hospital and a doctor tells you you have to take some medicine and take 200 milligrams of this and you have to do it within an hour or you're going to get real sick in your death. But then all of a sudden you decide you're a doctor too. And you say, well, I don't need 200. My body can handle 400. When you take that 400 milligrams of that medicine, you should not be in a position to complain to that doctor that gave you the instructions. Why? Because it was your disobedience that messed you up, not that doctor. The doctor provided specific instructions to follow. But if you didn't follow them, you can't blame the doctor for why you didn't get your healing. You can't blame the doctor for why that thing is not gone, why that circumstance hasn't changed, because he's given you instruction, but you just didn't want to listen to it. Let's look at the book of John, chapter 3, verse 5. God has given us a universal remedy for a universal sickness called sin. But it's only for those who want to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. For those who have been sin sick and in the waiting room. The doctors couldn't help your addiction. The doctors couldn't get your mind right. The doctors wanted to give you medicine and call you schizophrenic. The doctors wanted to put you in a mental facility. But God is saying, I have the remedy right here. John 3, 5 says, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except the man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. This scripture tells me, in order to inherit this new heaven and new earth, it requires a new birth. And if I don't experience it the way the Bible says, far be it from me to complain to God as to why I don't get it. In closing, for those of the people that are here, as I said before, you are in the waiting room. You've been praying for a long time. God, I need you to do this. God, I need you to do that. God, I need you to help me with this issue. But your faith was not there. God is actually saying tonight that we can all stand all over this building. If your faith meets the requirement for that issue, for that circumstance, if you can trust me tonight, then come. Because if you come to him in doubt, you're just going to end up with the same issues. But if you come to him in faith, God can deliver you from that situation. Whatever the issue is, put that thing on your heart. Put that thing upon your mind. Your wait does not have to prolong any more than that. Pastor, if you can come, please. In Jesus' name. Let us grab our hands and say, God. Jesus name. The waiting room. And so we want to thank God. I remember when I looked at uh, regarding the house of the Lord as a hospital. And you look at the church, and when you come into the house of the Lord, there's a lot of different people on certain levels. You have uh, where it be maybe where they're having the children. Uh, where they have in the babies, that's in another area or maybe on another floor. And then there's maybe open heart surgery or surgery that's happening uh, that's in another area of the hospital. And so when you look at the church, it is, it is like a hospital. Uh, people are needing a uh, new heart, as David said. People are needing uh, another blood transfusion, uh, which is the blood of Jesus Christ. A mind regulator. Uh, to renew your mind and all of these things when you come to church it is a hospital and so this is why I take and I look at everyone and I don't uh, I treat my brother and my sister a certain way because I don't know where you are in the hospital until I spend a time with you and some may be dealing with certain things and so once we find out what you're dealing with then it's better to be able to help you 
And so just like in the hospital, as far as the secular world. And so in this place, the great physician is Jesus. And he is the one that is able to heal us from all of our sickness and all of our issues. The only thing is, will you come and see this great doctor that is able to heal you from all of the things that you're dealing with in your life and in your family, in your mind or in your heart. And so we say, try Jesus. You've tried everything, try Jesus. Because he is the one that is able. But again, he is a merciful God and a gentle God. He will not try to push his way into your life, but he will ask you to come. So I tell you, come see a man. Come experience healing in your life and in your body. Let us anoint you. Come to the elders as we anoint. And we will pray that God will heal you for whatever thing that you're dealing with. If you believe in God, believe in also what he can do. He said for it to the us, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. In my name shall they lay hands on the sick. If you're here today, come and let us pray. Come and let us pray the prayer of faith on your life, on your family, on your soul, on your children. This is what the church is for. We don't come to just spectate, but we come to get involved with the healing that God has for our souls. And so for those who are coming to this altar, we're going to anoint and we're going to pray. We want God to touch your life. We want God to heal your situation. Heal your family. In the name of Jesus Christ. For Lord, we trust you to do it. We believe you. As the scripture has said. And we thank you for the word tonight. We're in the waiting room, Lord. And we're waiting on you. We've come to the altar. Let us lift our hands up to him right now. As we receive the healing. From the great physician. Jesus Christ. Of Nazareth. Father God we thank you right now. And we love you. With all of our heart, mind and soul. For Lord God you have saved us so long. Lord, many of us have been baptized in the name of Jesus and filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. And Lord God, there's still much more that we are in need of. We thank you for the healing of our souls. But right now, supply our need. Bring the healing in our families. Touch our bodies, oh God, from the crown of our head to the soles of our feet. Father, I believe right now healing is in this place. And God, you said by our faith, be it unto thee. And God, right now, touch, lay your nail scarred hand upon us, oh God, by your stripes. You are beaten for our healing, oh God. And so, God, if you're beaten and bruised and chastised for our healing, right now, heal the souls that have come to this altar. Father, young daughters, in the name of Jesus, that their lives need to be turned around. Father, sons, in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray right now, God, for families. We pray for healing, God, in our minds. Help us to rest and to sleep. For some, Lord God, are not sleeping well. For some, Lord God, are, Lord God, in anxiety, oh God, and stress, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. It's been a long time right now, God, and we've been in this condition right now, but we want the condition to change. We want to testify that he's still a healer. We want to testify he's still a weight maker. We want to testify he's still a savior in the name of Jesus. He's a heart fixer. He's a heart and a mind regulator in the name of Jesus. Us, oh God, we trust you to do it. We love you, oh God. We love you, Jesus. And God, in the midst of it, we're going to praise you. We're not going to murmur like they did in the wilderness. We're not going to murmur and complain. But we're going to say thank you for the miracles that you've already done. And if you did those, you can do this. If you did those, you can do this. So heal and set free. Heal and set free. 
heal and make whole in the name of Jesus. By your faith, by your faith, come on people of God, by your faith, it shall be done. You trust God that made the universe. You trust in the healer. In the name of Jesus, we love you, we thank you, we praise you, we give you glory, we give you honor. In the name of Jesus Christ, somebody open up their mouth and say thank you, Jesus. Come on, clap your hands and say thank you, Jesus, because you believe in the one that is able to do it. Man cannot do it, but only God can. We give you glory, Jesus. We thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We thank God for all that he has done in Jesus' mighty name. Clap your hands up to God one more time. We thank God for the man of God for bringing forth the word. God bless you. We will be in the house of the Lord on tomorrow for Monday night Bible study. We thank God for you. I thank God for those who are here. I thank God for those who come back for our elders and our mothers in the house of the Lord. We appreciate all that you have done and all that you do. Just your presence being here. Come on, hug your brother and your sister. Come on, give somebody a hug that you don't normally talk to. Just give a hug around their neck and say, Mother, I'm so glad to see you. Brother, I'm so glad to see you. Sister, I'm so glad to see you in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you. We love you here at New Life. This is family in the name of Jesus Christ. We give God praise and thanks for all the done. Come on back tomorrow. Monday night at 8 o'clock. We'll see you in the house of the Lord. In Jesus' name. God bless you. God bless you. Be healed, people of God. In Jesus' name. Oh, oh.